that work? Okay. My name is Christopher Bartling, and I'll be talking today about uh, test-driven uh, JavaScript using Jasmine 2.0 and Karma. Um, I'm an independent consultant here in the Twin Cities, do some agile coaching, development, that sort of thing. A whole bunch of different technologies, not just JavaScript. So, so I want to get right into it. Uh, how I want to kind of run this is I want to run through these slides really quick. They're, on, uh, they're available through the, uh, the GitHub repository. I've already pushed this stuff up. The pull request has been approved, so you should have access to this stuff. I want to get through these slides really quick because I assume everyone can read. I'd much rather try to do some live coding and try to actually do some test-first, test-driven development. So let's just get through this. Why are we justifying uh, JavaScript development? JavaScript's kind of becoming a first-class citizen in our products these days, so we should, off, we should really start treating it like a, uh, a first-class citizen if we were writing... Uh, tests for our Ruby code or our Groovy code or Java or C Sharp or something like that. Why aren't we doing the same sort of thing with uh, JavaScript? Let's not practice reckless development. So kind of a quick review of test-driven development. Use unit tests to drive our design. That's a really big uh, uh, idea here is that uh, test-driven development's really a design tool. Uh, write the test first to see that it fails. See that the, uh, the message that you get when it fails is an appropriate message that gives a lot of information. So if somebody, if they do uh, um, break the test, that they know how to fix it. Then make the test pass by writing the code in, then you have the opportunity to refactor. Test coverage remains high because you're, uh, every piece of code that you write is uh, written from a test. Make sure your tests are also fast. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how to, um, how to ensure that um, your unit tests in JavaScript stay fast, that test suite stays fast. Benefits of test-driven development, it's a design tool first and foremost. Builds confidence. It uh, really uh, is a great way to infer what, what was the intent of the code when I was writing this code. Um, why? Why did I uh, why did I make this design decision? If I can run the code and I can play with it a little bit with, through tests that uh, provides really nice documentation, and if we set up CI, hopefully we are all using CI and and things like that, we can avoid code rot. Everybody's kind of seen this before, I hope. Uh, that sort of red, green, clean um, continuum. So write that failing test first, make sure you have good messages, write the code to make the test pass, and then refactor your code and your tests, because your tests often uh, have duplication in them, dry them up, that sort of thing. Uh, something that, as I've kind of gotten better on my journey with test-driven development, I'm coming to the realization that a lot of times I want to do some spiking before I start to write production code. And so doing spike solutions and using like shelf sets or using uh, stashing um, is a really nice way to sort of, well, how do I want to tackle this problem before you actually start writing tests first and then stash that code away and now write, the, how you write that solution uh, using test first, test driven development. Again, spike solutions are typically thrown away the value is the learning that you're doing on that spike solution within your problem domain. So getting into some of the tools that uh, we're using these days, um, Karma is a test runner that uh, comes packaged as a node package. Um, I'm going to use it today. I'm just going to use it uh, integrated within JetBrains. I also have a grunt file that uh, I use Grunt uh, to do my builds, and um, you can also use Karma from Grunt. And uh, I just kind of show a little how you start up uh, Karma, and it basically starts up, and then you can get it into listening mode, and it can continuously run your test suites. 
One of the other tools that plugs right into this that I'll show today is something called Phantom JS, which is a headless WebKit browser runner, scriptable with a JavaScript API. And this, this basically is the, um, the browser that I'll use to run my tests on. So um, when I did this uh, presentation, put together the example, um, I've done this typically with Jasmine 1.3. 1, 1, and uh, I updated it for Jasmine 2.0. So there's some new things that, uh, especially with some of the spy verification that has changed in Jasmine 2.0, that uh, if you've used Jasmine 1.3 and you're going to Jasmine 2, you'll see some differences. Not difficult. A lot of it is very similar, but um, they have changed some things. Jasmine 2.0 has a sort of hierarchical structure to it for a test suite. It's a, a behavior-driven development tool. Uh, it's uh, coming from the Ruby world. It, it looks very much like our spec if you've used our spec before. Tests are known as specifications. You've got built-in matchers, so when you're doing your verification, you can uh, use some of their built-in matchers to do those, those expectations, uh, verif verifying your expectations for the uh, specification. And uh, a big uh, feature of Jasmine is their spy support. Spies are a type of test double design pattern, which is a testing pattern, and we'll get more into that. You'll see some of that today. So the very top of this, uh, of a Jasmine um, asset is the Jasmine uh, suite, and it's, um, it's described right here as a describe block. It takes a string describing what that describe block is describing and uh, then it takes a function. And you can nest these describe blocks to get more of context, uh, kind of build these context spec uh, specific specifications. And I'll show that when we get into the live coding. Within that, uh, that describe block, you can have more describe blocks or you can have uh, specifications and that specification is uh, detailed with uh, uh, an it function. And you um, sort of, it sort of looks the same as a describe block, has that string uh, description and then takes a function. And then within that, within that specification, we might do, we might execute the system under test and then um, verify um, some sort of, uh, some, some sort of uh, state or maybe verify um, the uh, a, t a test uh, a testing spy that you may have set up with some expectations as to uh, how that spy should work and i'll show uh, examples of this but just trying to get the syntax piece out um, jasmine can also use this concept of before each which is a um, another function within a describe block that kind of sets up your test fixture uh, your specification fixture, I guess you'd want to say. And this before each will then run each time for each example, each specification within the describe block or in a nested describe block. There's also after each, works sort of the same way, but it tears down, tears down anything, tears down your fixtures, that sort of thing. Um, one of the features that uh, Jasmine allows you to do is um, you can use, you can start to share state between the before each, the it, and the after each using the this reference. And this is nice in that um, each cycle of before each, it, and after each gets this new empty object that is then referenced through this um, and uh, makes uh, you know, cleaning up building uh, a testing context kind of nice. Um, I don't see this used a lot for some reason, so I don't know. Just uh, some of the matchers that we use today. And these are built-in matchers that come with Jasmine. I'll also note, note that there are matchers that you can go out and uh, include like uh, the jQuery Jasmine matchers that bring on a whole bunch of other types of matching 
uh, if you need to do more DOM manipulation or DOM verification, those sorts of things. We'll see some of these being used today. You can also build your own custom matchers using the add matcher syntax. In this case, it's uh, I'm just basically adding a uh, to be less than matcher, setting up a message, and then actually doing the test. So the, the this is being used here to set the message if that uh, if the boolean result is false. You can also do loose matching. Loose matching uh, is typically used. Um, can be used like uh, when you're doing uh, when you're doing your verifications with uh, with your spies. We haven't hit the spy stuff yet, but basically what I'm doing here is I'm creating a spy for a, a certain namespace and then a function called foo, and then I'm actually executing foo, and then basically saying did I did I, um, I I'm asking the spy, did you get called with any sort of number and then any sort of function? Which uh, can be helpful if you, uh, if you have, if you want to test something, you want to verify something, but it's, it's hard to actually do the verification. So Jasmine gives you this kind of loose matching, uh, Jasmine any matcher. Partial matching, we can use Jasmine object containing function, which basically does something very similar to the any, but basically I have a result. That result could have many more properties than this, but I'm only verifying that two of the properties and their key values are, or their key and value are, are available in that, uh, in the result. So a big, um, a big feature of Jasmine is, a te is this uh, Jasmine spy functionality. It's basically an interception-based test double mechanism that the Jasmine library provides. So you don't have to go out and use sign-on or something like that. You can just use this. Um, it's very similar to mock objects. If you've used mock objects and other programming platforms. And uh, the Jasmine 2, the Jasmine 2 uh, spy syntax is quite a bit different than the version 1.3 spy syntax. So there's a couple of different ways you can create spies. I mostly use the spy on stuff. To uh, I know what object and function name I want to uh, spy on typically. So that's what I typically use. Um, but there are a couple other ways that you can just create bare spies, that sort of thing. So I've got, had a couple of examples here of spying and then verifying the invocation. So it typically you kind of set up your spy, then you execute your system under test, and then you verify that some sort of interaction or collaboration happened. So I have a spy on my dependency, which has a render function. And then my system under test will, I'm, I'm calling display on it, and within it, I expect that the spy, the, sp the render method on my dependency will, will have been called. When I'm, uh, if I want to do spine and I want to verify indirect outputs to my uh, dependencies, I can then basically uh, verify that uh, the, the dependency was called and that it was called with a, um, with a, a parameter or arguments. This can get a little bit more complicated and uh, maybe I'm calling something, and this is uh, right directly from my example. I'm gonna do a earthquake um, mapping exercise today. I'm using something called Leaflet, which is a mapping, open source mapping tool. And this is the first time we see some of the new Jasmine 2.0 um, syntax. So it used to be, um, they didn't do that and dot, dot call through. That's new in Jasmine 2. So I'm going to spy on leaflet on the circle function. And then I'm going to process results. 
So I'm executing the system under test. And then I'm expecting that I, uh, that I will have called the spy and then a circle constructor spy, which I don't show getting set up here. Um, I wanna make sure that their call counts. I called that twice. So that's all new in Jasmine 2, where you, uh, you um, reference this calls uh, object. And then args for call is, um, that's actually, I think doing the old syntax, I didn't update that. But basically, I'm verifying that the arguments for the, uh, the constructor call were uh, the first constructor call, first argument was an array of two values. So these are the uh, kind of the uh, laying out these new calls for spy usage. So and call through allows you're basically using the spy, but letting it call through the real subject instead of using it sort of like a mock or a stub or something. And return value, you can just return a hard-coded value, call a fake, you can uh, generate a result from a function, or you can throw errors, which is kind of nice if you're trying to test kind of alternative pathway sorts of things. Some of the new tracking features, calls any, gives you that Boolean result, call count, We've seen already um, how many times was my spy called, if it's going to be called a couple of times in the system under test. Args for you can get at, and then you can get all the args. Some more of these tracking features. You can return to this context with all the arguments for all calls. Most recent um, arguments for the most recent call other things, resetting the, uh, the tracking on the spies if you wanted to reuse a spy. So my earthquake uh, map demonstration, I'm going to pull live data from the U.S. Geological um, Survey and it's formatted in a GeoJSON format and what it does is it gets the daily earthquakes um, around the world and plots them on this map. And each earthquake uh, shows up as a red circle, the uh, radius of which is determined by the magnitude of the, uh, of the earthquake. And then I bind a popover annotation to the earthquake event. So you can see detailed information. The existing solution is fully tested with Jasmine Spies. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a little user story where we're gonna change the, uh, we're going to write, um, kind of change the solution so the uh, earthquake event circles are actually coded or colored by the magnitude of the, uh, of the earthquake. So these are, this is kind of the user story with some acceptance criteria. Um, probably a little, you know, I kind of wrote it kind of technical here. So I had uh, the actual color values, I could pull them from the story. So let me, um, let me go to the, uh, pre to the uh, code. I'll show the, uh, the map first, whoops. So this is the map and uh, we can move things around here and you can see that um, that the map shows that we have a lot of earthquakes happening, obviously in California, but along that kind of Pacific Rim. And then we also have the Pacific Rim on the Asian side, which is kind of known in the um, geological circles as kind of the ring of fire. That's where a lot of our uh, earthquakes actually happen. But they're all in red. Um, if we kind of dig down into some of these, you'll see that um, some things are happening in the Dominican Republic, which is interesting. And then you can also click on these, on these um, earthquake event circles to get um, kind of where is this happening and the magnitude. So pretty simple. Um, so I have, um, the, sim the implementation for this is basically uh, a single file. Let me just 
introduce some things here. So I've got this kind of single file thing where I'm just doing, uh, building kind of a, an object called a map view. It's going off and doing some things with, um, it instantiates the map view. And then it initializes itself, processes some results. We also have the fetching of it, which I'm doing here, which goes against the live earthquake uh, feed. So this is all today's data. Uh, and um, it's a JSON piece, you gotta proxy that. But um, what we're gonna do here is I'm going to drive, uh, basically um, drive changing this uh, solution so we get these colored uh, earthquake map circles. And we're gonna do that test first. So what I'm going to do, I need one more thing here real quick. I wanna bring up the story for this. And that will kind of guide our development here. So I just have this in a text file. So first thing for first things first, um, I'll run the tests. And seven, we have 17 tests. I have this set up. I have my uh, Karma runner set up to start up with a Phantom JS. So you never see a browser window. Um, this is all happening headless, and uh, Karma is just managing all that, um, managing that with the pro with the uh, Phantom JS process. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to actually put this into auto test mode, and then just start writing tests and writing the code, and you'll see this thing um, kind of update itself down here. I'll keep it kind of low. Can everybody see the code? Yeah, the code's big enough. Okay. Can I go smaller? Okay. That'd be great for me. Yeah, nice. Pinch and drag. There we go. That's interesting. Hang on. Yeah, just hang on. All right. All right. I don't know why it just likes that, but. All right, let me get. I think I got it now. All right, I've got, uh, I, I got it down here now. So let's just rerun these, make sure they're running. Wow, <laughs> okay. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I want to, uh, actually want to um, create a new method or a new function on my uh, map view that creates the uh, earthquake. This uh, earthquake um, uh, event circle. So we'll see how this goes. So I've got a couple of live templates that I've built up and uh, built out in WebStorm or configured. So um, I'm gonna call this thing create earthquake event circle. Can you still hear me okay? Okay. 
getting some feedback. And um, var, let's just do a quick example to get us going. So I have a map view that I actually have defined up above here. Right here. And that map view is actually in a, a higher level describe block. So I have access to that. And I want to create earthquake event circle. You'll notice that um, it's already failing. It's telling me that uh, whatever you thought was going to be defined is not defined. So let's uh, create that. Yeah, I typically go, it kind of depends on how fast I want to move. If, if it's code that I'm not real sure of, I'm going to go slower, so I'm going to go one at a time. Um, we, might, we might jump a little bit and write a whole bunch of specs, and then you'll see me do that once we get into sort of the colors and stuff. So. So that passes now. So get the start of my function. Next thing I want to do is I want to um, I want to see that we actually um, call the uh, leaflet circle. Here, I'm going to do a spy on. This is the first, uh, it doesn't take very long before you need to start using spies. So what I want to do here is uh, my dependency is the leaflet and specifically the circle function. So leaflet is accessed by L, alias to L, and I'm going to call the circle. Yes, I did. Yep. Uh, it's L has been defined in um, in the test runner, uh, so it's, it's bringing in leaflet, and leaflet defines itself as L. It's actually going to be in Karma. So karma is just going to bring in leaflet. So it's just in the leaflet JS. That's where it's kind of getting it from. Yep. By the way, karma.conf.js is where you configure karma. I don't have a slide for that, but uh, it is in the code, and the code is available on GitHub. So this is. Not sure, I've never tried that, I guess. I'm pulling it for like a CDN or something. Okay. It's a good question, I, I haven't tried it. I've always done all my uh, dependency management through Bower or just copied it down and just referenced it here. 
Um, it probably did. Anybody know that uh, answer to the question? Just So while we were talking, I was just can keep coding because this will take a while. But um, basically, what I'm doing here is I, I want to make sure that we're calling the circle function from Leaflet. Again, um, my system under test here is creating that earthquake event circle. So that's I'm setting up the uh, setting up the test, executing the system under test, and then doing some sort of verification, and it's failing. And uh, what's nice is that uh, Jasmine, through its uh, through that uh, that failure message, is basically saying, "Hey, you expected to uh, expected spy circle to have been called, but it was never called." So let's go over there and fix that. And now the test pass. A little bit more to that. I want to make sure that uh, um, I want to pass in some parameters. So I want to start uh, building out, setting uh, the latitude, the longitude, sending a, ma uh, uh, a uh, magnitude. So let's get those in here. So latitude. Longitude. And uh, magnitude. Let's get those first. And uh, I want to change this a little bit to... Um, I want that the circle spy to be called with latitude, longitude, and um, a radius. I don't have a radius, and so that radius is the. I'm using just a a, um, a math power function. So let's get that up here too. Radius is calculated. Using that magnitude. So that is now uh, failing. And it's failing because I am not using the right version of it. And kind of nice, they kind of, Jasmine tells you that you need to use the right version, which is to have been called with, and then you can pass in or do matching with arguments. So let's do that. Okay. So we're still uh, failing there. So at this point, um, I need to be able to pass in 
latitude, longitude. and magnitude and we'll calculate the radius then the, it is magnitude yep okay so our function doesn't take that yet Let me close this a little bit Still failing, so I need to don't have a radius. Now we do. Here we go. I, by the way, have done this uh, exercise a couple of times, so this isn't like I'm doing it live for the very first time. Um, so uh, at that point, at this point, I want to now. Um, I also need one other thing uh, on this. Uh, on this uh, circle spy when I create it, it also takes uh, some style options. So I want to get those on here. So I'm going to add those. Don't have that yet. And um, I'm just going to put some some uh, styles on here that we're going to need. And these will change. And fill opacity. Okay. So now we're um, we're now failing again. We need to somehow pass these in. Oops. So let's do that. Close it down. <coughs> Yeah, it's banging against the lanyard, so. There we go. Oh, it turned off pin mode, okay. So, we now have the style options working. Starting to build this thing out. Now we can actually start to kind of get to uh, the story, which is right here. So what we want to do is we want to show that earthquakes of magnitude less than one get a uh, boundary color of that hex, uh, that 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 hex uh, color, and that the fill color is that. So let's do that one. I won't go through all of them. I have a shelf set that I can. Uh, I'll I'll back this stuff all out when we get closer to that kind of 10 minute mark and I'll apply the shelf set and uh, we'll see that um, kind of all the tests kind of walk through that the last couple of minutes and um, see some of that. But what I want to do here is now I want to kind of get into uh, doing a kind of a um, another describe block here. If this thing would, that's annoying. 
one another describe block down here, which is the uh, magnitude based coloring. Just to kind of keep it, keep all the tests around how we're doing, how we're uh, driving this uh, magnitude coloring and get that uh, started up here. So let's do or turn that off right now. It's not enough s screen real estate for that. <coughs> so it Actually, I don't want to do that quite yet. I want another describe block. So I want to do uh, magnitude less than 1.0. My fill color should be this. And, uh, I kind of I have to set the magnitude here to something under zero or under one. So I'm going to read redefine magnitude. And I know that uh, on that circle that I get back. There are some options that I can, let's call it circle. I can type and I expect circle dot. There's some options here that I can reference and I can ask for the fill color. So if we run that, notice that uh, that fails. So we'll go back over here. And we need to now test the magnitude. So if Style options. There you go. Time do we have here? We'll do one more. So let's do the um, do a reformat. We'll do the uh, boundary color next.
Now I want to actually, I kind of want to do this, um, do that uh, executing the system under test the same way. So I'm going to do it before each. So I'm kind of refactoring here so I can get this, have access to it. I also need to share this, so. this so we're using that context that this context so on here now I just want the color to this, run that, that should fail, over here, Obviously, when I have more real estate, things are easy. Things are easier to keep open and stuff. So, 27-inch monitors are nice. Um, so, I, I've kind of shown you how how I'm kind of driving the tests. Test first, drive the design from the tests. What I'm going to do is I'm going to back this out and just um, show you what it looks like when we're completely done. So, I'll just revert these with my shelf set. What we have here now is we've got a uh, number of tests. You can see how the tests are the magnitude. I've blocked up the, the, uh, the individual tests by magnitude. seen some of that spy stuff and the implementation is right here I actually have a little bit, little bit different uh, implementation here where I'm setting fill color and color and then using those in the style options and if we run all those now we now, we now have 32 tests everything's running and I also um, wired this up into the process results. So we're calling that uh, that create earthquake event. Whereas we were, we were creating this uh, circle in line. Now I'm delegating off to this, uh, this uh, function. And if we look at our, I believe we have our, yep, we have things still running in grunt. If I go back over to my map uh, with the magic of live reload it reloaded and now we've got these colored circles by magnitude so we can looks like something happened in guatemala that's kind of an orange color for a magnitude 4.25 or 4.2 um, magnitude uh, earthquake so get this to really work though it's really important to have user stories that have good acceptance criteria that's my plug for ad, uh, agility these days um, yeah yeah well um, I hope I hope people are getting better with that um, we'll see but uh, as you can see there's different colors here um, earlier this week uh, when I was doing this there were some really large earthquakes in Japan that was, uh, that was pretty interesting, but uh, I don't have those today, so. Um, so let's go back to the presentation. 
I want to give some time for questions. So we saw that. There's uh, Karma coverage. If you're interested in doing measuring coverage, there is a uh, Karma coverage plugin. It uses Istanbul, and then it uh, saves the reports out to a coverage subdirectory. These coverage reports kind of look like this. This is for a, uh, a backbone project that it was doing. And uh, when you've got lots of tests, you get 100% coverage. I don't use this stuff a lot because um, you can game coverage pretty easily. So some unit testing tips. I strive for one uh, one assertion per example, just um, mainly because if the first if you have multiple assertions and the first one fails, the rest of them are not going to execute. I also think it's easier to understand when you've got one clear assertion, for example. It's easy to set up, especially using Jasmine with their with the hierarchical uh, uh, composition of specifications. It's really easy to set up tests. Um, Another thing that I uh, like to do is I like to intercept uh, J uh, jQuery AJAX so I'm never, I'm truly doing unit tests and I can use then something like uh, jQuery Jasmine and set up uh, JSON fixtures that are uh, just asynchronously loaded for the test and not have to be calling um, any of the, uh, like a, have the, having a backend server up and running to get uh, test data, so that's really helped keep my uh, unit test suites um, fairly fast. So how do we sustain all this? Well first you got to practice. This stuff is not, um, doesn't come natural. It hasn't been a natural type thing for me, and so I have to practice at it. And um, it takes time to learn. I, I, I do a fair amount of agile coaching and some clients um, expect that uh, you can just kind of turn this stuff on and it's just going to work and it's not like that. Um, do pair programming. Uh, learn from somebody else. There's lots of ways to do this, lots of tools to do this. Um, and then run continuous integration. If you're always running your test suites, you're probably going to care about them a whole lot more. Make it, a, uh, make it a cultural thing when your test suites break. That's the most important thing that you work on. Don't really talk about it in here, but functional acceptance testing, really, really important. Lots of tools to do this. This area is getting really interesting. Um, lots of different really good tools. Um, definitely use this stuff, especially if you're changing your CSS and things like that. Um, that can be really helpful. Just some of the tool references, you can look these up. Some of the uh, recommended reading for um, that I, I really like for JavaScript, uh, John Resig's stuff, Doug Crockford's uh, Good Parts, which is pretty small, fairly dense for being a small book, and then Christian Johansson, who I believe is a sign-on guy. Um, there's some other resources out there. Uh, James Shore, who is a big agile guy in the community, he does a test-driven JavaScript uh, uh, screencast series that's really quite good. Um, and then Egg, Egg, Egghead IO, um, especially if you're doing Angular, they seem to be the forefront of the screencasts around Angular. But they're also getting out into D3, into unit testing. They're big into unit testing, that sort of thing. Code Katas, I've been, um, I'm going to point out Project Euler, I've been kind of uh, doing some Project Euler stuff lately, and they're really nice, small programming exercises. I've been doing Python, but the, you can do any sort of language, and they're probably an hour-long uh, exercise, and again, just practice with this stuff. Presentation, GitHub repository is out there, I've also forked the Midwest JS repository and have all my stuff up there so the PDF of the presentation is available. If you're interested in doing more of an in-depth type thing, this is a little plug, I work with DevJam, 
We're doing some uh, test-driven development with Jasmine one-day classes. Doing one in Chicago and then uh, another one in Minneapolis. That's it. How am I with time? All right.